Hello, I'm Bob Denton, and welcome to another conversation. School choice, especially post-COVID, has become a public and political issue. Homeschooling as an option has increased 63% since 2020. We're joining me in a conversation about homeschooling is Russell Wrightson, board member of the Organization of Virginia Homeschoolers. Thank you so much for joining the program. Thank you for having me. Well, let's start off, and would you please um, tell us a little bit about the organization of Virginia Homeschoolers, its history and mission? Uh, so the mission of the organization is to provide uh, inclusive support at a statewide level for homeschoolers, including monitoring legislation as it comes through, directing people towards their local co-ops, um, and just generally answering questions at a higher level. Obviously, most homeschooling is occurring in the home and in the community direct. And certainly um, in this post-COVID uh, environment, there's a great concern about our public schools in general. Um, disaster, disastrous test scoring across the nation, but certainly also here in Virginia, sh teacher shortages. Um, when we look at some of the recent polls, Gallup poll in September of 2022, satisfaction with U.S. Uh, education, public education, down to among its lowest at 42 percent. Um, the Harris poll, 8 percent of parents say that they certainly it now has become um, a great concern and a political issue. The point is that I guess the COVID has really brought forth an opportunity to look at all the different options, including homeschooling. Yeah, absolutely. And so there's an opportunity there. Well, so, um, so about how many, um, what percent of uh, children are homeschooled in the Commonwealth of Virginia? Do you know? I'm not sure. I know that prior to COVID, uh, especially in more rural areas, um, homeschooling has been, just been on the rise consistently. Obviously, when parents got home uh, and they could hear the instruction, could see the engagement that their kids were having uh, remote, uh, that number went up pretty dramatically. Uh, but I can't say I've got all the numbers in front of me now. Right. Well, um, pre-COVID nationwide, I thought it was interesting, it was only about 3%. I thought it might be higher than that, but now, of course, it's right at double digits. So there has been, as we say, that big increase since 2020. Well, let, let's go from the ground up and have an under, uh, operational understanding of, of homeschooling. Um, do you have to receive permission to homeschool? Is there someone you have to tell and say, okay, um, my, the, this child, these children are going to be homeschooled? Uh, so permission is one of those words that will upset some homeschoolers. It's not, <laughs> it is not permission that you're receiving. You do need to uh, meet certain credentials, but you're not receiving permission. You are notifying the county you're in that you're choosing to homeschool. And I guess it certainly differs state by state, but in terms of Virginia, what one must do? You must inform and it's pretty much that or do you um, sign any kind of agreement of certain things as minimal expectations? Or what's the process in Virginia if you want to homeschool? So for Virginia, you've got four options. The most common option is option one in which you would um, have your high school diploma or higher, and then you send in your notice of intent to the county. And at the end of the year, you provide evidence of progress. Uh, the other options are if you don't have your high school diploma, um, there, are, there are other things that you can do to fall under the homeschool statute and still qualify. Did I get around the word <laughs> of permission again? Yes. Uh, to homeschool. Um, and the assumption is that one or both parents are the primary uh, person of record in terms of instruction. Is that fair to say? Yeah, uh, that once you've chosen to homeschool, you're, you, the, the parents are responsible uh, for the education. Obviously, your kid is going to learn everywhere they go, right? Which is, which is a root fundamental uh, belief, I think, in a lot of homeschoolers is that education is not just in a classroom. It's not just from a teacher. So, 
Um, can you, um, let's say you have three children and they're two or three years apart, can you have um, multiple instructions across grades in one site in your home? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, can is a tough word, right? So if you're <laughs> juggling three kids, what you can do and what I can do might be different. Uh, but yeah, a lot of families will, you know, even inside of the institutional education system, you're going to be, it's a lot of rinse and repeat. You're delivering a certain kind of information to a different depth uh, every year, right? So if you've got three kids that are developmentally at different places, you can be teaching them the same source information to a different depth and understanding. Does the time of instruction at home equal to the same number of hours or time that you would spend in the public school? Depends on if you've got 32 kids at home that you have to take role for. <laughs> uh, no, so there's just a lot of classroom maintenance that is not in management that's just not required. A lot of homeschool families, depending on the way they choose to do it, um, you know, are done in, by noon, right? Your lunchtime, you're wrapping up. Uh, and it also depends on the kid, right? <laughs> Some are more committed than others and they can make a 30 minute last uh, math lesson take two hours. Well, so if I, um, uh, if you're in the third grade, uh, states have fairly detailed what the curriculum would be. Are you obligated to follow the same curriculum as would be presented in the public school? You're not obligated, but one of the methods for providing evidence of progress is to take a nationally normed standardized test. Wow. And those are based on the standards of learning. Uh, so if you don't follow the curriculum, uh, unless your child has absorbed that information elsewhere, uh, it's possible that they don't perform as well as you would like. Um, so in homeschool instruction, I guess, do you give tests? Do you grade written assignments um, like you would in terms of if you were in the public school? There's no obligation for that either. And so if the parent or the instructor feels that some kind of assessment makes sense, helps the child, motivates the child, or motivates the parent, um, then you can provide that. Uh, I'm not quite sure what homework would look like, right? <laughs> this is the work we do in the living room, and this is the work you do in your bedroom, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> uh, so, so where are the sources of your instructional materials? Uh, commercially produced, or does the school systems provide um, some materials? Where do you get the, re, uh, the materials for instruction? Yeah, the school system doesn't provide anything, though you can go, and I often do go to the Virginia Department of Education website just to get a get an idea of uh, what their courses are going to look like. But a lot of homeschoolers and homeschoolers in my community uh, like to be like to refer to themselves as eclectic homeschoolers. So a lot of library time, a lot of resources just from I, I probably have you might see about 100 board games behind me. Uh, so board games are a great resource for getting into a topic. Uh, the curriculum can come from anything, but yeah, absolutely. There, especially since COVID, there's a lot more online resources. Mm -hmm. If there's a subject you don't feel strong in. You can find somebody that can get your child to the point where you want them to be. And that was one of my next questions that is there a thing like we would call in at the university setting a hybrid model where you would do it, but you could perhaps, whether it's purchase or online or something, integrate some of the um, lessons uh, online and through the web. Uh, that's acceptable as well, I'm assuming. Yeah, the, the real requirements are just to pass that test or um, provide some sort of evidence of progress at the end of the year. What you do between that August 15th date and August 1st date um, is, is up to you. Yeah, you can get that education from anywhere. Now, let's say that I'm completing the uh, fourth grade and I will move theoretically to the fifth grade. Do I participate in, and you said you could in terms of SOL or a national test of some sort, 
And that provides a verification that you submit and say, okay, you are officially, you did pass the fourth grade. You now can go to the fifth grade. How does that work? Uh, well, you just have to pass, yeah, you pass that test, um, but grade levels are not a thing that homeschoolers are going to focus on. Um, so you would just take the test that is appropriate for where you're at developmentally. You would submit the results. In Virginia, you have to meet the 23rd percentile, or they like to call it the fourth stay nine, which if you do a Google search, you will only see the Virginia state law in homeschooling. Nobody uses the term stay nine, really. Um, and once you meet that standard, you're good to go and can choose to homeschool again for the following year. So if you get through the 12th grade, you don't get a diploma, do you? Or do you get a GED degree or what? How do you show that you uh, graduated from, from school? So my wife, uh, my wife was homeschooled actually, and sitting in her now home office, of course, right? Uh, there's her, there's her master's degree from William and Mary, right? And a second master's degree in geology, and above all of it is her GED from homeschooling. Uh, which so homeschoolers can take a GED and need to meet all the requirements the public school children have to meet for that. But also in Virginia, there's really no guiding um, law that says what administering a diploma looks like. So oftentimes now parents will just deliver the diploma once they feel their child has completed a course of study. And uh, it would just be written out. I'm hearing, uh, read a little bit about now there's kind of these homeschooling, and I don't know if that's the proper term per se, but several families were shared in these pods, school pods. Um, have you noticed that particular trend uh, in Virginia at all? Absolutely. The pods was definitely a COVID homeschooler term. Mm -hmm. um, we've been calling them co-ops for a really long time. I personally don't really know the difference other than, you know, families would pot up just for comfort level as, a, um, as far as exposure is concerned uh, while COVID concerns were, were peaking. Uh, but yeah, that happens a lot. Um, a lot of times you'll find other families have children that really line up with the way one of your children or all of your children need to learn. And so creating that smallish, more intimate classroom experience where you still have a peer to bounce ideas off of can absolutely be helpful, especially for the more social kids. Well, may I ask you, and you don't have to answer if you don't uh, wish to do so, but may I ask you why you and your spouse decided to homeschool? So as I said earlier, my, my wife was, was homeschooled. Mm -hmm. So when we were coming to the decision, uh, it wasn't there's public school and I'd like to fight the system and do this other thing. They were just two equal choices because I like her. I know that a homeschooling individual can grow up and be healthy and intelligent and socialized, right? There's a taboo. Um, and so we just made the choice to homeschool, always understanding that if it didn't seem to be working out, we can move them back into the public school system. Um, but it's been working out. And what are some of the specific, if someone says, can you articulate some advantages of homeschooling? I guess one obvious one is that the personalization um, in terms of the instruction, uh, much more can one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Is that one of the greatest advantages from your perspective? Yeah, and I guess this is more personal too as a homeschooler. I have always been relationship first with the kids. The education absolutely is important, right? Uh, but I think a lot of that is just going to happen so long as they're willing to talk to you, so long as they're comfortable. Uh, and early in homeschooling, there was a guy, Gordon Neufeld wrote a book about peer attachment. And that was a big deal for me, right? So you get kids that are growing up inside of a school system and they become attached to peers and those peers are torn away from them and over and over and over again. And so they lose the ability to trust the relationships they've built over time. So being a stable support person for the kids has been very important to me, yeah. 
And over the last couple of years, and now we even see where the whole notion of education, public education, parental involvement, I read where one of the motivators now is simply, look, I, I have my values. And, um, and therefore, the public schools, I don't want, to, I want to be able to express and have them in the settings and exposures to the things that, as a parent, I think that they should be. And that's um, uh, one of the high motivators now in this very political and polarized environment we're in. Yeah, I think it's really difficult, too, because you get a lot of people from the, in the public school system that are saying, just teach them math just teach them this, right? Uh, but you've got kids that are going through things in their lives that are just gonna ask questions because like I said, these teachers are mentors, their peers are mentors. You don't get to remove parts of the child or parts of that development just because they happen to be in a public school. It is always whole child. They're always, you know, when they're in the classroom, the whole child is in the classroom. Uh, and yeah, I, I do have a lot of values that I like to teach to my children, one of them including per, being able to have perspective, uh, being able to be inclusive. Those kinds of things are important to me. And I, I definitely am able to teach them. And I don't think I could not teach them that. The fear of public safety now, I mean, you know, no school is safe. Now they're becoming, depending upon the nervousness or what have you, uh, but there's a safety concern now that at least the child would be at home rather than out there in, in schools that um, people are feeling less safe in. And even the, the children themselves, when you're practicing hiding and running and, and all the different things that we've seen, that seems to be um, uh, an increasing rationale or reason for homeschooling too. Yeah, rationale, I think, might be difficult, right? You're probably more likely to get eaten by a shark. Uh, that's not to say, as the media <laughs> puts that stuff out there, right. uh, that it's not absolutely terrifying. But I like, I like to feel that the kids in my community are relatively safe. Obviously, we should do as much as we can to prevent uh, the tragedies that we've been seeing. But yes. hopefully, they're not as likely to happen as it feels like it's likely to happen. Right. Well, you know, one of the things that I, I found that actually homeschoolers have a better graduation rate nationally, 67% to 59%. Um, they do perform 15 to 30% higher on uh, standardized tests than the national mean. And 72% of homeschoolers perform uh, above the mean on the SAT scores. And so there certainly seems to be, when you take the national average of the public school and the homeschool students, there's better performance. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I think it's easy to, so you don't know what you're drawing, right? You're definitely getting engaged parents. Uh, it was that Mark Twain quote on uh, three kinds of lies, right? There's lies, darned lies, and statistics, right? So I'm not sure. I love homeschooling, but I don't just love homeschooling because I think that my kids are going to be better educated, better from a statistically um, educational level. I think they're going to be better people. And I also saw that 69% uh, of homeschoolers uh, also uh, graduate from, from college at a higher percentage. Um, well, now there would be some who would say, okay, I understand some of that, but you can not get the same socialization in homeschooling as you can in a school with more diverse, by definition, in terms of income and, and, and race and what have you. And so what would you say to them as that would be a negative in terms of homeschooling? I would wonder if that's actually the case. Um, these school districts are drawn geographically. Uh, so we've got a school up here that's pulling in this uh, neighborhood where both parents have, are, are convert, you know, where, where I live, both parents are commuting to Northern Virginia. They're making this much income. They're this and this and this. Um, and the school's drawing those in. Well, certainly it's drawing in different neighborhoods, but you're not seeing every kid in the school all the time. Whereas my kids are 
at a park day, at a board game day, and our community comes together. And the only thing that defines who's going to be there is the desire to homeschool. They've got kids of different ages, kids of different economic levels, beliefs, all of that sort of stuff. I know it's anecdotal, but what I've seen is more diversity, more range of experience for my kids. And the other big thing some would be concerned about, you wouldn't still, you wouldn't get as much socialization in homeschooling as you would in schools. Um, how about that? I just think my experience doesn't bear that out. Mm -hmm. uh, we, <laughs> I, I organize a group around my area and we are constantly out. If anything, I'm having a hard time squeezing in the time to do the more formal schooling at home because we've got a thing now and now and now. So, um, so when um, there's not the same access to perhaps school activities, there are more clubs, uh, sports, things like that. Is that a dimension uh, um, even in terms of some of the dances um, and, and, and different things, homecoming and things like that. Is, is that a part that they just simply homeschoolers are going to miss? They're just not going to be able to participate in? Well, there's definitely a homeschooling prom. We've got a spring fling coming up. Um, I'm planning it. So our, our group is planning it. Things happen, but absolutely. And I think sports is the biggest thing. Uh, the Tebow bill, as it was framed, got vetoed. It's made it several times, but homeschoolers cannot participate in high school sports. And I, I think it's a pretty massive injustice and there's not a homeschooler that would uh, say they don't want that law passed. So from a um, operational standpoint um, and politically perhaps question, but do you think that um, state and federal funds should support, whether it's by vouchers or some other mean, homeschool education? Uh, my personal beliefs, I think, are still up in the air on that. I know that a lot of families don't want any federal funds uh, moved into homeschooling because with the money comes legislation that restricts homeschooling, right? Uh, personally, I think it would be nice to be able to purchase some curriculum, but I, I know that the schools need the resources uh, and taking away from the schools is not something that my family is interested in doing, right? Well, so if someone says, okay, if I want to do this, what does it kind of cost? I mean, what, how does one measure the expense of homeschooling out of your pocket? Because there's no tax break for that, right? Um, so that's spending. It, how would you inform someone about what it would generally cost to homeschool a child? A lot of families just find a way to make it work. Uh, my family, we're a single income family, so the cost is pretty significant. There are definitely single parents that homeschool. Uh, there are two working parents that homeschool and they just find a way to make it work. Uh, the flexibility uh, inside of the Virginia law and inside of just the way children learn is there and it can happen, but the, you know, the cost can be significant for sure. Or you just figure it out and, and uh, teach it, teach things in your home and avoid the high tuition rates of all of these online classes and yoga classes and places and stuff. So we only have a couple of minutes or so remaining. Um, if one of your children, age appropriate, comes to you and say, doggone it, dad, I, I want to go to public school and be on the football team or basketball team would they be, what would be your feelings? <laughs> would you be inclined to say, well, okay? I'd be inclined to say no, <laughs> but I, I know that I should say yes, right? Mm -hmm. So I would, <laughs> I would give them some time to think about it. Uh, and then we would put them in and see how it goes. It would be hard. It would be hard. Well, in the final a uh, minute or so, what would you say in summing up your elevator speech about homeschooling, the advantage and 
uh, for, for homeschooling? I just think homeschooling is an entirely different beast. Uh, if you are schooling at home, if you're looking at the model, the institutionalized model, uh, and trying to recreate that at home, you're likely to have a very difficult time. Uh, but if you look at the whole person, the whole child, know that you can learn stuff outside, you can learn stuff at events, you can not teach a subject for three months and just dive into something that they're in love with right now and do some cross-disciplinary learning, work everything into it, just know and embrace the flexibility and the absolute chaos that is homeschooling, then I think that you know everybody's gonna be better off for it. Well, thank you so much. That's all the time we have. I wanna thank my special guest, Russell Wrightson, who serves on the board of the Organization of Virginia Homeschoolers. And of course, I wanna thank you for joining us and hope you'll do so again for the next conversation with Bob Denton.